You're going to introduce Recording it. Is yeah. On. So today is uh, another conversation with Mike and Hugh. And I wanted to have a review with Hugh about uh, self development, the way of the householder, and letting go. Um, and for I'll post for those who don't know, um, uh, we've I've talked to Hugh before, and he, we've he's done a, we've done a few series about self development, uh, enlightenment, and the way of the householder. So uh, please go back to those if you haven't seen it. Um, moving the conversation forward because um, I'll, I'll talk personally at, at some point in the journey. I felt. Um, when you start letting go of things, or if you want to speak to it, you, uh, there's a sense of uh, directionless, aimlessness. The only thing I can think of is becoming uh, sort of a person who just wanders from place to place, uh, like, a, like a samurai who doesn't have a home, like a, what do they call a wandering samurai. And I, I don't know how to navigate that. I mean, yeah, we still continue to live our lives. Uh, you mentioned being if the world, in the world, but not of it. So meaning we're not attached to our jobs, what we're doing, or even to some extent our families, our friends. But we still live. Uh, we act like you know things are going normally, but in mentally, we're still you know we're de we're detached from it. So I, I, I'm starting to understand that. But also there's a sense of going, like, don't know where to go. And I've made certain decisions and uh, had friends tell me, oh, it seems like, well, friends who seem more like they have a better understanding, they say you're following the direction of life. And so I don't, I don't know where to go from there or if you have anything to say about that here. Okay, so let's just start off with uh, what the fourth way is and the way of the householder. So, okay, so uh, do, you, do you want me to go do, over just the history of it? I think it would be useful so other people know yeah, what sure. we're talking about. Yeah, okay, so okay, so so the uh, where all this comes from was really from the Bhagavad Gita. So um, the the Gita was laying down, you know, how uh, the path of Dharma, so in other words, like the path to wisdom. And they, uh, Arjuna, uh, Krishna tells Arjuna about the caste system and, and essentially saying that the, you know, these three ways is the way of the Brahman, the Kshatriya, and um, the, uh, the, the ascetic, so, so the sannyasin. So, so you were really supposed to. Um, if you were a Brahmin, you were supposed to really go through your life as a householder. When your kids were grown up and stuff, you were supposed to then go into the forest and become an ascetic and a renunciate and uh, you know live uh, live like a hermit. Um, so those those were the paths to to wisdom in the laid out in the Gita. So what happened was. As industrialization and civilization got more and more developed, it, it was a growing school of thought that, you know, it's like, you know, not all of us can go and do like the Bushido tray, you know, thing and be a, a Rohan and wandering samurai or be, um, you know, Kshatriya warrior and be a warrior, you know, of that warrior caste. And, and you know, you, you think of Zen archery and stuff. That's the way you must think of all of these ways. Um, they're all really ways of, um, uh, destroying the ego. So uh, they said, well, look, for the majority of people, they householders, they've got responsibilities and kids, and they, you know, Buddha left his wife and kid and just went off to be a sannyasi. And that was it's a bit of a no-no. It's a little kind of a gray area. So if you're hardcore, if you're a hardcore monk or ascetic, then you'd say, yeah, your responsibility is to the Atman and the self and so you know self-development so screw your wife and kids <laughs> it's a very harsh matriarchal kind of thing and the Buddhists don't look that kind of thing in the eye if you you know you make them very awkward if you say uh, was Buddha such a good guy he just abandoned his wife and kids and they also they make 
excuses and say, well, he was a prince and he lived in a palace and they were looked after him. But there's something a little bit phony about it. And so this was, I think, a growing sign of thorn in the side for, for um, particularly for householders. So uh, they're saying, you know, essentially like, oh, so, you know, spiritual development is a luxury for princes and rich people and Brahmins and stuff. And I mean, like, screw this, man. Uh, and so the, it, it increasingly became obvious that there needed to be a fourth way. And so the, the fourth way school is, uh, it's in India, but it was, I came to it Gurdjieff. So the, the cult I was in was uh, considered a fourth way cult. And, that, and that's basically what, it was uh, an offshoot from Dr. Rolls and Spensky and uh, line along that line that came from Gurdjieff. And Gurdjieff invented the, the idea of, you know, the fourth way, the way of the household. But there, there is a lot of it still in, um, in, in India. So if you, if you go and like hang out with the Sri Ramakrishna guys, the Vivekananda guys and that, they have, um, you know, in say the Ramakrishna monk, they have the monks and then they have the householders. They're actually very antagonistic towards each other. The householders think of themselves as doing their duty, being responsible, upholding, you know, the Dharma and the society. And they say, you know, the monks are kind of negligent. It's kind of easy to be a renunciate and go and live in a temple. And so they, you know, but then the guys in the temple say, yeah, but you guys are defiled and you're not pure and you need to have pure thoughts and no distraction. So you can see the problem, problem here. But for us, we, we're all householders. The West, the, the the religious path was in, say, the the warrior. It, it ended by the Catholic Church ended it. So the, the last warrior cult, I think, that we can think of is like the Freemason. So it went underground, maybe you could say the, the um, I mean, the Templar Knights. You, you could say the, the Freemasons were, took over from that. But in in essence, it, it became, even if you a Freemason, you, you, it has to be a hobby, <laughs> spiritual development. Has, you have to do it in place in, and hold down a job and support kids and have a household. So the way of the household is extremely difficult. It is in the most difficult way. It's just, that's all that's really left us, unless you want to go and live in a dojo and become a monk or something like that. But, uh, it's probably not available. By the time people want to go, unless they're really hardcore, they find themselves already in the world and the world's got a plan for them. And so, you know, people in the, in the, in the city um, feel they need to develop too, and that's, that's what it is. So, so it's tough from, from, from the get-go because you've got to go and do stuff mentally, which you can, it's kind of easier to do it physically. It's, it's easier to do what the Buddha did and just abandon your wife and kids and go off into the jungle to meditate. It's quite di difficult to, to do meditation and things in a household when you've got screaming kids and stuff. And, um, but I think overall, although it's the hardest way, it's the best way because it keeps you real, right? So the problem with you being a ascetic or being a warrior, there's plenty of room for you to bullshit yourself. So, you know, for, and it's kind of the rule almost that if you look at these, these Buddhist monks, if you go to a temple or an ashram, they have a spiritual ego. They haven't got rid of their ego. They've got a lot of learning about Buddhism. They've, they've got this monkish attitude, but you can make them angry easily, which shows they have a fat ego. And, and so they kind of deluding themselves. They, they, they're in an environment which makes it very easy to pre pretend that you're making spiritual progress because it's like, you know, it's like studying without having an, an exam. But as a as a householder, you've got an exam every single moment. You and and so you know, while you telling yourselves, oh, you know, I'm just one with the cosmos. You know, your wife's going to say is like, have you done the shopping? You said you'd fucking do the shopping. <laughs> and you say like, well, that is part of the cosmos. It's really difficult to say. <laughs> you know, like ah, she also is part of the cosmos. That's bigger than a monk you know so uh so so you really put to to the test but you know if you've got kids in that you, you have to learn to meditate in place and do and there's a way of exploring 
um, in place so that, you know, that, that what I did when, as a householder is um, uh, you, you've, if you, you've got to go easy, you can't push too hard. Right? You can't say, okay, now's my meditation time. And you set, you try and do things by the clock and you try and set a schedule. And say, That's, mm -mm, I, don't, I don't think that works. But you can, you see, what I found was you let the Kairos and the universe speak to you. So, so you can meditate because you just wait until the, the, the universe gives you a time and then you say, oh, this is my time. And, and so, so you see, the, this is the, let me give you an example. This is the wrong way to do it. If you've got kids, then, you know, the, the kids will be annoying and do annoying crap and stuff. And you think, you know, like, how can I make spiritual progress? Because <laughs> you've got this tape in your head saying that, you know, you've got to develop or something. And, and so what, what I found was you, you, if you just say, okay, well, this is what the universe is presenting to me is these noisy kids or this fight or something going on. And then um, yeah, the, you, if you just go with it and kind of let go of the idea that you've got to make spiritual progress, that, that is the fastest way because what you find is that uh, kids don't do anything for long. Kind of the rule with kids is whatever they're doing, it's it's very short duration and it's going to change. So it's, it's kind of comes in like the weather or sea or something like that. Uh, but uh, you see, this is the wrong thing to do. It's like, kids, quiet. This is daddy's, this is daddy's meditation time. <laughs> it's like you can't, you can't do meditation on that basis. But if you say, okay, this is not the meditation time. The dogs are barking. The house is on fire and so shit like that. And then you... And then now what a lot of people will do is they try to get control. Say, so kids, now, daddy's, you know, don't, you must stop playing, whatever, blah, blah. And don't do that shit. Where you basically have to uh, just say, like, you know, whatever these kids are doing, it's hyper annoying, but just restrain yourself from saying anything or doing anything. You will find that it's very short-lived. And then suddenly there'll be a period where it's quiet. The house, there's no one in the house and everything like that. And then, then you can go, oh, this is my moment. <laughs> and then you can meditate. But in, in all those things, is you, you have to learn to, to do them in place. You see, like, it's a bit like um, Euler. Euler is a mathematician. And he, uh, Euler was tremendously pr uh, productive as a mathematician and prolific. And... But it was weird because people say they couldn't ever see him really doing maths. He's, he would play with his kids and he would be jogging them on their knee and running around. With them. And, he, and then he said, I, I'm, I'm doing maths in my head while I do that. And in a lot of ways, it's like doing maths in your head while you're interacting with the world. So, for example, you know, as a, as a householder, you have to... Uh, live a kind of dual life. So you, you can sit in an office meeting and you're looking at these people saying like, what, what are these people? What is an organism? What is a human being? How does a brain work? And you're looking at, you're, so you're kind of detached from it. And it's, it's marvelous. It's absolutely remarkable. I mean, uh, the, the number of hours of business meetings and stuff, it's just just looked at the to and fro going on between people, not kind of listening to what they're saying as much as like saying, like, you know, if you're an alien looking at this happening and you're an anthropologist or something or ethologist, just looking at these human chimps interacting, you'd be like, fucking hell, man. It's just staggering. And the speed that their brains work, the, the motions, how quickly, you know, basically you can you can almost see the hormones and the chemicals and the stuff and the, you know, the five brain layers switching. And it's Beautiful. It's kind of like, you know, it's comparable to looking at a National Geographic um, documentary about squids or you know, the deep ocean. And you can see the squids change color and, you know, as they move across a background. And watching human beings in that talking or <clears throat> something is you can often see that kind of thing. So it's a, a religious experience in an office. What the average person is doing is they listen. They, they're stuck in one part of their brain. They go like, OK, I'm with the boss. So they're. The primate brain is saying, boss, boss present. Then they got that going on. <clears throat> then, uh, you know, if you're a woman, then you'd have 
would be particularly dominated by your mammalian brain and you'll say well <clears throat> we must make sure this meeting goes well and it's nice and it's agreeable and everybody's locked in this kind of <coughs> unself-aware thing uh, you know they, they think it's very important that this and that and all they're saying is you know this part of my brain is activated mammalian brain reptilian brain say oh you oh you insulted my ego now, you know, my reptilian brain, I've got this fucking T-Rex inside me saying, like, don't step on me. I've got big teeth. And it's all going on in a fucking office environment. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with the job, the company, or what anybody is there. And, but if you step back and you look at the, the world in that way, <coughs> you can start to see yourself. You can start to see, as you're talking, you can see, oh, look, that is coming straight from my primate brain. I, I can see myself changing my tone. I, as I talk to the boss, I can see I raise my voice a little bit because I'm trying to show I'm subordinate. That's all coming from my primary brain. While you've got this other observer looking at you, that is really doing very, very good spiritual work. Because what you're doing is it's kind of like developing what I was saying earlier about today about this kind of second order intelligence. So it's kind of like getting an observer of the, the other five brain layers. So what's happening, I think, in your brain, I suspect, is that your alien cortex is developing an alien cortex of its own. And at some stage, you, your ego, which is in your alien cortex, transfers into this new system. It's, it's not, uh, it's not a, like a big bump on your head kind of thing. It's 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 the wiring. I'm, I'm, my guess is it's the wiring of your brain. It's the connectome. So you're wiring up a new connectome. It's kind of like wiring up a third brain, and that's what Gurdjieff said too. He he said you know he wrote a book called The Man with Three Brains, <laughs> and that's what he was talking about. That third brain. So some people would call it the third eye, but it's it's really this intelligence that supervenes on every day. So most people embodied subjective they're like a dog in a fight it's like your dog never stops being a dog you you never i've never seen a dog you know gets seem to get self-aware the dog's always fascinated in other words it's always uh observing and connected to its senses and reacting so it's in this kind of action reactions response and most people sophisticated people with phds they're also doing that they they in space that the dog inhabits and most people don't even know that there's anything more than that i think a lot of phds and stuff and very intelligent people they, they, they would think you're talking nonsense if you said no there's you, you're missing a brain there's an extra brain that you can get with a lot, a lot of work you can wire it up they wouldn't believe you because they they think they're smart they think you know, the, the primate brain telling them, I'm the alpha here. I, I got a PhD because I have imposter syndrome and I wanted to prove to everybody that I was better than everybody else. And my primate brain told me to do that. But they never stepped back and observed themselves that way. They never said, you know why I did this? Because I, I was inadequate. I had, I had a huge feelings of inadequacy. And, um, you know, that's why I got my PhD. And then, you know, People don't have that kind of self-reflection, not, not on their lives, not in the moment and stuff. So it's it's getting that observance. But yeah, um, it's, I don't want to say it's dangerous, but you can see it's kind of like doing brain surgery on you in place <laughs> while you're walking down the street living you every day. So that's why it's difficult. Yeah. Yeah, you put a lot of but things. But the alternative perspective. is not doing it, and not doing it, your life is, is harder. You see, I, I think it's harder to live the life of a dog, as in, as in, you know, dogs biting each other and chasing their tails. It's better to, you know, step out of that. Does any does a did that help at all? Does that? Yeah, that yeah. Explain? I think you put you put things into perspective because uh, I don't know if others will feel it, but I know this my i was set on maybe in my mind i was just set on detaching 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 and even to the point of um you know with those conversations just detaching was uh, i would think okay i'll do my self-reflection self later but sometimes later wouldn't come 
so I had that issue. I, I would detach. I feel like I would detach even from that self-reflection in the moment. I wanted to probably self-reflect at another time. And I felt, oh, I could. I don't have that time because I'm always doing something as a householder. But, but saying that you can self-reflect at the moment, yeah, that's, that's something new for me, actually. So it's time is the enemy, right? Time, time is really the thing stopping us becoming enlightened, right? So it's there's a poem called Rupert Brooke wrote this poem called Dining Room Tea, and it's just about um, this moment where he's having tea in you know kind of Edwardian drawing room in Britain, and it's just I think it's at the moment where. Uh, the the hostess is just pouring the tea, and he sees the sun just you know catch the light and on the tea and stuff, and it's like the whole world stops for a moment. And so it's that that moment of kind of suspended animation, that very deep. Um, and so that's a moment of timelessness in time. And so it's those moments are moments when when you really alive. The moments when you're running after a clock is um, are the moments when you're effectively dead. You're not really there. So there's another movie uh, called Clockwise with John Cleese. So the, the 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 guys in Monty Python were very wise. Well, they still are. Still are. <laughs> Some of them are still alive. But, but they um, they are very very smart. If you see that movie clockwise, that's really what it's about. John Cleese is, a, is the schoolmaster that's really, it's an alien cortex. The schoolmaster is trying to keep control. And the more he tries to keep control, the more things go to shit on him. The more there are misunderstandings, and, until he eventually loses it. And when, when he loses it, that's his freedom. That's, then he gets everything he wants, everything that was out of his reach. He was trying to get to by having more order, more control, living by the clock, being completely thing. Basically, when he gave up on the clock and being wise and trying to be the best schoolmaster in Britain, that he finally became a human being and achieved the state that he was trying to get to with the clock. So um, there's another moment also worth mentioning on the school with uh, with Monty Python, and that's uh, in the in the life of Brian. No, no, in the meaning of life. There is this thing, kind of funny, while I was mentioning kind of an office conference, because there's, <laughs> there's this American office where the pink, the, the purple permanent assurance skits. Right? In the, right in the middle of the movie, the, they have all these guys sitting around a desk in a corporate environment, and they're all in suits, and they're having this kind of board meeting. And they say, it says, right. Gentlemen, we're meeting today, of course, for our usual thing, kind of like us with the extinction audience saying. And today, the topic, of course, is the meaning of life. Have we made any progress on this, gentlemen? And then the Michael Palin character says, um, says, oh, yes, yes, uh, <clears throat> I've had a team working on this. And he says, uh, yes, we found two things. Uh, the first is, first of all, people are not wearing enough hats. Second, you know, and then he goes into this thing that it sounds like Krishnamurti or something. And he says, you know, life is, um, you know, uh, has a, some people say we have a priori, an individual soul, but it's unconnected to the, the biggest soul because, uh, you know, we, as we try and pursue that, we are distracted by mundane and trivial things. And, and as they say this, that the camera pans around and the, it's a very woo-woo moment. You can see almost see the walls moving. And, you know, everybody's going into the zen-like state as he gives this really deep thing. And then uh, what, the G Telly Gilliam character or whatever goes on, he goes, and suddenly the music stops and they do this, this jump cake. And he goes, uh, what was that you're saying about hats again? <laughs> so that was perfect because they, the, the moment of Nirvana was, was, was exactly what he was saying. It was trashed by trivia. So, so trivia steps in and trivia in, uh, in essence is the clock. So it's the cop and the clock and the trivia. So you will find this. You, you see, just at the moment, 
what the alien cortex is doing is it's protecting itself. It's it's doing diversion. So I said uh, this morning in the thing that it has a, a few tactics to preserve itself. So one of them is inversion and substitution, then deflection, diversion, and and you know really denial or ignoring. So you will see, particularly like in an academic and stuff, they will employ all all five of those. You can see them, and they're working to preserve their ego. So, so the what this one is 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 diversion, and you'll see it happen just as somebody is getting insight. They're just about to do you know panel four on the ten bull sequence. So they just about to see the bull. The bull knows it, and it gets scopophobia. So the bull goes, oh, oh, don't look me in the eye. You look Soren in the eye, and that's the end of me. So you don't show. It'll go just at that point when everybody's about to go. Oh, Zen, we finally saw the alien cortex and what it's doing and uh, the tricks it's playing. And just before that moment, you'll see somebody go, oh, anyway, we have to wrap this up, you know, time and stuff. And so then they run to the, it's, uh, we'll get back to spiritual development later, but we're out of time. And always time, you know, the clock always comes in. People say, well, that was good, but we're out of time, out of time. So it's that thing that you say, what are you going to do? You, oh, the next meeting, what's that for? Some stupid ass shit. So you never get into Buddhahood because some stupid ass shit intervenes and say, why? Your alien cortex is doing it deliberately. It's, 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 it's in, a, in other words, it's kind of like another video, which is like Blackadder and uh, the, the one with the prince, you know, with the prince regions. And you see, the black adder character is the butler. He, he dresses in black. In a sense, he represents our alien cortex. And so, although he's the butler, he really has run of the palace. He's really the butler, but he's running the fucking palace, the, the Rowan Atkinson character, black adder. And the prince is a stupid fuck. And every time the prince is about to get on, you know, clock what the butler is doing, that the, the, the butler is really acting as the prince. He's a usurper. Just as the, the prince is about to get there, you know, Black Adder would distract him with something. So, you know, but you see a lot of, there's a great little line in it where he said, like, well, oh, I'm back from my, my holidays. He says, he says, well, is it good to be black, uh, back Black Adder? And he says, oh, yes, it's good to be back in the saddle. Saddle? I meant harness, your majesty. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like he's so obviously in charge, but he's pretending to the prince, humoring him to, to make the prince feel like he's in charge. And that's exactly what's happening in our neurology. Our, our alien cortex is supposed to be the butler, the servant, the Ian McGill Christ servant. But it's usurped our home. It's, and just as we're about to say, hang on a minute, I'm the fucking king, you're the fucking servant. And just every time we're about to get to that point, the alien cortex goes, hey, bah, squirrel, <laughs> oh, squirrel, <laughs> it deflects, divert, inverts, and so everything, those five tricks. So, so you, so it, basically, with the help of somebody else, you you can start to stalk your own alien cords. Eventually, you say, you see, you start off not even knowing this this kind of reduction of your brain into five compartments like this, and then as you go, you start to realize, oh, you get a little whiff, get a little whiff of what Hugh's talking about, this alien cortex thing. Now, some people will say, oh, I know exactly what Hugh's talking about. They don't. <laughs> they made a model of what I'm talking about, and that's substitution. So they're substituting a straw man, and they say, oh, yeah, I know all about Hughes' alien cortex. And they're, like, they're talking about their straw man, and the alien cortex has done a very clever trick. It said, I understand everything about it. It's not me. It's the straw man idea. And so you, whenever I refer to the alien cortex, then they go, the alien cortex refers to their idea of the alien cortex instead of referring to itself. <laughs> and But as you gradually stalk, it, it can see itself. You start to see, hang on, there's an imposter in this household. There, there is this alien beast. I have a demon inside me. And then you're getting somewhere. The moment you see that demon, you go, oh my fuck, I've seen the devil and he lives inside me. He is me. <laughs> And then that's the fourth fourth panel in the full bull sequence. You see the bull. Yeah. 
Makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I think it's starting to make sense. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So going back to the time, I think that's so. Uh, I mean, the thing I wanted. How how do we? So I, I like that self reflection idea in the moment. Self reflect. It's just, uh, and I know that the this alien cortex will will try to do do its tactics. So it, it says the best is something. Should we try to trick the alien cortex? So you have an alien cortex to the alien cortex. Is that the only way? I think no, the, the, the very yeah. first step. The, the very first step is not to take it seriously. You see, like the clockwise character with John Cleese, is we take it supremely seriously. It's like, well, like this time is really important. Why? Why? What, what the fuck's going to happen with the next meeting that you miss? This thing that you're rushing to. The, oh, it's my bedtime. Oh, it's my lunchtime. Oh, it's the meeting time. Oh, I'm going to be late for this. It's like, who gives a fuck? Have you ever bothered to see? To say, like, look, I'm tired of the world. I'm sick of the world. I hate the world. I hate everybody. I hate my job. I don't care about the next meeting. It was, you see, this is the, another movie, Office Space. You see, that, that guy did it. You see, in Office Space, the guy eventually got sick of all the bullshit. And he goes, like, I don't want this job anymore. I want to be fired. So he went and like guts a fish and is on his desk and does everything. He just fucking doesn't give a shit. As soon as he does that, he suddenly gains the status and the importance and stuff in the workplace that he was denied while he was following the clock. You see, the clock's for slave. You see, if you can be late, it says I'm the boss. See, it's a way of, you see, what the boss is doing is guys have perfected being late. The boss is never on time right you see if you want to be the boss in a meeting like this is you just be late you see I, I could i could have done it to you with this meeting so if i want to establish my you know my authority over mike then basically i all i have to do is keep you waiting i think basically you'll probably wait 10 minutes make sure that i fuck around for 10 minutes keep you hanging on then i come on and then i say well here i am mike what's up to and then I've established my authority. Or I can also I can also do it anyway. So anyway, uh, we've got to wrap this up, Mike. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I've got other shit to do and stuff. And then as soon as I say that, I say, I'm more important than you. I, you. You're a small fry. I've got bigger things to do than you. And this is what people are doing to each other all the time. And it's horseshit. It's horseshit. I mean, Elon Musk does it, I bet you, 20 times a day does that trick. And he's saying like, if you followed him, if you shadowed him and went to his next meeting, you'd see it's fuck all. He, he's going to go and smoke a joint in the in the bog, you know. It's it's like a lie. He's lying. Or you go to a meeting where it's just bullshit. He just made this meeting to fuck somebody around. It's it's uh, these guys are playing with us. These these rich guys are playing with us because we're too stupid. We we're running hard. We're trying to keep up with the clock. And they're shoving this, you know, sand in our face. So they're saying like, oh, must be late, must be punctual. They're using it as a stupid whip for us. But if you if you get to the point where you say, I'm, I've had it. I don't care about this job. See, see, I, I did this in, in America. Uh, when I first came to America, I was, you know, on this um, H-1B visa. It was like, They strung it out because they're paying you about half your wage because you're, you're an indentured slave, right? So, so they don't want you to get a green card because you're going to fuck off as soon as you get a green card. So they string it out, string it out, string it out. They make sure that they pay for the lawyer. And you say, oh, that's very kind of you. Well, it's not. You've basically lost an extra three years because it's their lawyer. The lawyer represents them, not you. And they do all these tricks to make, keep your wage low. But anyway, I went through all of this. And... You know, then I, I did, I was a very, you know, scrupulous um, employee because, you know, I was a um, very conscientious employee because, you know, I wanted to this green card. When I got the green card, then I was like the guy in office space. I went like, okay, well, that's it. I don't give a shit anymore. <laughs> I had another job lined up with a startup. And so I thought, well, now I'm, I'm you know, this is four years they've strung this out, right? When I did that, 
I was amazed. I, I just tried di different things. I, you know, I, I always heard that some, some guy, I don't know, I was, um, I think, uh, Wellington, the Duke of Wellington. I heard that he, when he came in in the morning, he just got all his letters and mail and chucked them in the bin. And I thought, wow, is that how you become a general? I thought, I've got to try that out. So I did that. And so I normal my day for four years, I had at least 100 emails that I had to plow through every fucking morning as the first thing. When I got in, I just select all the emails, delete. Go and have coffee. <laughs> it's like, and you know what? Everything worked better for me. It was people would come and what I realized was people were using me, right? The, the hundred emails was they knew I was a, I was a sucker and I, they could get me to do their work for them. So when I deleted them all, they they would come and they'd say, "Ah, oh, you, I um, I sent you that email and they said, did you get it? Nope, didn't get it. So why didn't you get it? It was important. And so I highlighted alert and everything and say like, oh, probably deleted it. What did it say? And then they'd say, well, it doesn't matter. Because you didn't respond, we sorted it ourselves. And you're like, that's what everybody was doing. <laughs> they were just shoving their work on me. And so then when, when something really important came up, then somebody would come and say, like, oh, I'm just checking you got that email because it's about the company party and we're leaving at 6. You say, okay, I'm on board. <laughs> so you, I didn't, you basically, if you rely on the Bush Telegraph, you you can filter out all that crap where the guys are actually using. And then I did stuff like I, I'd go like, okay, afternoon time. Well, doesn't look like there's much action going on. Yeah, I'm going to go down to the gym. There was a like company gym on the first floor. And then I found that was where everybody was for four years. I wondered why I was working my ass off from like two to four o'clock in the morning and could never get a meeting with anybody. When I went down to the gym, I found all the executives and the managers and all the employees, they were at the fucking gym at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> I suddenly realized, well, I could never get a meeting or never get anything done. It's because the guys were fucking around. So when you only see that stuff when you start to fuck around and you start to stress the system and you start to you know, basically go against it. So, so the very first step is to stop believing in the system. Just believe that it's a, it's a whole fucking joke. It's all a scam. It's all just, you know, guys trying it on. It's all bluff. It's all scam. There's nothing legit. Nothing. And as soon as you, re you realize that, you realize it's, it's all people just trying to take advantage of each other. And so it's like the first thing that happens if you don't close is that no one can take advantage of you. If you become a random number, it's like, you know, it'd be like, Mike, I can never get hold of you. It's like, yeah. So I'm not just fucking slave. <laughs> if somebody can get hold of you, they can get hold of you. You can get your handle, you know. Get your number, get your handle. Use you. So all, we're in a prison now, and everybody's using everybody else. So the very first thing to say is stop supporting the prisoner we, we're all you know prisoners and wardens of each other we're all holding ourselves in this prison yeah. the very first thing is to just say i'm not going to do this anymore and the first thing that happens is you usually find that things get better you suddenly get all you suddenly start going in the direction that you couldn't make any progress in because you're like a hamster on a wheel yeah i, I mean <laughs> i see where you're going there and i mean I, I'm aware of that. Yeah, it's just uh, I think we you, you've spoken or you've had discussions before that um, yes uh, we had to kind of do these things uh, kind of against the system, but at the same time uh, I don't know strike a balance because if we're too much of a rabble rouser, well it's kind of like the nail that sticks out. Won't they get one? You know they'll they'll go to you know, end up in jail, they'll end up in a mental asylum. So it's it's a game, right? Like you have to, yeah, yeah. But, but you see, to be a good player, you see, if, if you go to Japan, you become a very good player at this game because everybody's playing it. <laughs> and they're very subtle, very, very fine art, artists at this game. So 
it's you know in America and stuff the game's a bit more gross and uh, there's a lot more noise and a hey, lot less art. But yeah, I, I'll tell you there's I'll tell you one story about this guy called, called Russ. <laughs> they happened in like the dot com era when I was in San Francisco. Is uh, was hired as a consultant to the startup company, and it was a weird time. The guys had like they had a hundred million in funding. Uh, no, 50 million. They were going to get their next 50 million, the next tranche and stuff. So I rocked up at this this place, and uh, I thought, you know, I thought, yeah, okay, all these guys are completely out of their depths. They, nobody should have given them a, a bean. They're all amateurs and stuff. So I pretty much considered this 50 million is pretty much mine. They <laughs> just don't know, <laughs> kind of blackout of style. But there was this guy called Russ. And he was he was a very very smooth operator, right? And he had just come back from Japan, and his skills. So he has like dojo level skills, <laughs> black belt level skills in this kind of art. Um, and and so he had the same idea. When when I arrived there, we both realized that we were both at kind of this level where we both saw eye to eye. He also thought these guys are a bunch of amateurs. There's basically 50 million in this whole company. I can direct it from the middle, from the back. And so he saw that I was also playing the same game. So we had this, we over about a year, we had this life or death struggle to see whether Russ or me was going to, you know, take control of those, these bunch of idiots and all the money they'd managed to get. And, and so I, I, I won. But he gave me quite a battle, and the but when I lost it, <laughs> but when he left, it was it was a strange compliment that he he gave me, uh, and he said, "Geez, I don't know if I should tell you this now. Suddenly regretting telling you the story." So he uh, he came around and he said to everybody, um, you know, like shook hands and said, you know, I hope I see you again and stuff. And he was, as, as he was walking out, he left me till last because he knew that it was me that the reason why he was got booted was because of me. And so he he came and he said, he, everybody was watching, you know, the whole <laughs> office was watching. And and he, he came and he shook my hand and he smiled and he said, like, he said, Q, I thought I was top level. Yeah, you know, I came from Japan and I thought I was in the class of my own. He said, I have never, never met a player like you. And he said, I gotta take my hat off to you. Shook my hand and left. And and everybody in the company was saying, What the fuck was he talking about? And I just said, You guys will never know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, I developed my first software product out of that company. <laughs> so so anyway, that I just say I'm 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 telling you this story because I'm just saying that that the you have to be a next level player in the prison yard. See it doesn't you you gotta you can't see that the loads of people have different ideas about how you handle the prison yard. So they say, Oh, you must make a stand against it and you must make a principled stand. It's kind of like Roger Hallam's in that camp. And and many other activists, they say you do the right thing, made it make a principal stand, and you know, um, it, okay, another movie, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, and there's this guy. It was a true story about um, uh, Lawrence van der Post, who's a famous South African uh, writer, and it was about a prisoner of war camp in Japan. In that movie, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, it was played by David Bowie. This this character, the main character, called Celiers. Now, Salias is in this Japanese prisoner war camp, and he takes this path where you go head head to head with with Japan. So in other words, he is an individual for the Japanese empire in this camp. Of course, he got slaughtered, and that's what happened in real life. So it's very dramatic. He he made some headway because he made individually, you know, the 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 prison the the camp commandant, the sergeant, and that. He got their respect, and and from getting their respect, they they completely altered their view of prisoners because they despised the prisoners. They didn't. They thought it was better to 
to die than to become a prisoner. And so they thought that these guys are weaklings and stuff, and they thought, well, I've never become a prisoner. From Salias taught them that there was a different kind of courage and resistance. So after that, they respected the prisoners. And that's how it happened in real life in Lawrence von der Poth's life. But, but the price of that is it's a martyr thing. So you, you're going to go down. You, they're going to take you down. You go, they're going to put you on the cross. Now, if that's your destiny, that's the limit of your understanding. And you have to go with that. It's, it's not a bad thing. You know, if we all did it, it might work. The problem is that messiahs and Christs and martyrs and stuff are very few. They don't change the world. They, they just, you know, they say, oh, well, we'll make set an example. So they're like, yeah, like, what kind of example did Christ or Mother Teresa say? Like, nobody follows that. They all go, ooh, ah, keep it at harm's way. So they, those guys don't get anywhere. So then the next thing is guys like my brother who say, you knuckle down, obey the rules, and we find, no, they're going to use you as cannon fodder. Basically, you're in Auschwitz. They're going to work you to death, and when, they, when you can't work anymore, you're going to go to the gas chamber. That's what the billionaires and the Elon Musks and the Gates are going to do. Is we're rapidly becoming su superfluous to population, right? When they got all the machines, machines are taking our jobs and AI has got rid of us and stuff, then they, their dream is then they, 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 they're eugenicists. They're going, to, they're going to wipe us out, right? They're not going to give us a UBI and say, hey, you go off and live like a billionaire. They're going to say, you're a fucking problem. You access superfluous to humanity and they're gonna make you know boil your fat so that 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 path doesn't work the path that i recommend in the in the gulag is you appear to be a good soldier but you you always um you always working against the system mainly from uh tacit disobedience so in other words you you're an underground wrecker and that that's the strongest position if you take that position you, you will suddenly see there are a lot of people playing that strategy. So, so see, you know, you know uh, the, the other strategy, which is complete nonsense one, is, oh, you get to be the head, you know, you get to be the top dog in Auschwitz. That's how you survive. It's like, no, it's, you, that's Scarface. You, you wind up like Scarface. They'll take you down like, you know, the top dog, with, all the guys who have that mindset, you'll find there are a lot of guys that have the same idea. They think if I can be the, the top dog, richest on the block and stuff, you know, if I can be the Don, I'll survive. It's like, no, they always take the Don out. So you're, you, that's not a good strategy. And, and so eventually you come to the thing and saying like, okay, you, you've got to go underground, work against the system and, um, and, and not try be the top dog. You try and get as high as you can, be as fluid as you can, uh, and and work against the system without anybody knowing. Now, as soon as you start that game, then you start to see other guys like Russ and, and these guys. They're very smooth operators. That the armies of people you can't see them. Most most people can't see them because they've got the strategy is well. If you were really super clever, you'd be at the top. No, only an idiot would be at the top. Only an idiot wants to be king of the castle because it's a Game of Thrones, right? So, so it's like, what, what do you play in the Game of Thrones? Well, the best thing is to be as an eminence Greece, a great cardinal. But you, you, you want to be close to the king, but nobody knows that you have the ear of the king. And, um, and you're not working for the king. You're working to bring down the whole king. So, so you guys like that they, they can be very, very powerful. They're kind of more like Rasputin kind of thing. So Rasputin did more to bring down the Tsar than Lenin and the revolution combined. And he, so very, very powerful as an individual. The, 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 the next things you have to worry about is the people that, that can spot you doing that. They think you're a wizard, <laughs> like magician powers and stuff, stuff like that. But you see, as soon as you start behaving like that, you can see that, oh, lots of people are playing that game. You start to see them, but you can't see them until you, you're playing that, the same game. So anyway, this is all strategies to provide the prison yard. But ultimately, the thing is to bring the prison yard to an end and, and free everybody, because we're not supposed to live in like this. And it's, it ends in, in destruction for all of us. Yeah, um, I think that puts a lot of things, well, I think... I didn't write 
because uh, I think in the last meeting we were like talking about writing and I stopped writing. I'm gonna, yeah, but well, anyway. Um, yeah, yeah, a lot of things. Yeah, it puts everything in a perspective. I think the only thing that's left in my mind is about, um, yeah, you, okay, we bring down the prison yard. And, but is there a, like, I guess when when we when I started like letting go, I felt like there's no, well, there, no direction. I don't know if you have anything to say about like no path or you know. I mean, we're still living our lives, doing our things, but you feel like there's no path to go, or I don't know. What, what do you? So there's no the the path is in the moment, right? So you know the path instantly in the moment. So there's no path like, you see, if you have, uh, you need a grand strategy, but you need to be able to give it up very easily as well. So if the best thing is to, if guys like Napoleon and stuff like that, they don't really have a grand strategy. In some ways, they have a hundred grand strategies. And But when when the opportunity presents themselves, they instantly know which strategy they're doing. So, you see, a, a bad general will put everything in, all the eggs in one basket. They, they, you see, Napoleon said, all the generals I defeated had one common trait. They all decided in their own minds which way the battle will go before the battle had started. Now, that's an incredible thing to think about because it meant that Napoleon didn't you say, okay, Napoleon's easily one of the greatest generals of all time. So he's giving you an insight into why he was one of the great generals. Now, it's kind of astounding what he just said there. He said that all of those guys had a battle plan. And in a way, he's saying, I didn't. My Napoleon, the best battle strategist that the world has ever seen, didn't have a battle plan. He said, that's not fucking possible. Is Either he's fucking lying He's just uh, diverting, or otherwise there's something deep here that we need to understand. So then you go back to the battles. Go and look at the Battle of Austerlitz, Bordelino, stuff like that. And you say, okay, let's see if old uh, Nappy here was, Mr. Bonaparte was bullshitter. Say, okay, let's look at the Battle of Austerlitz. You go and you say, like, did he have a plan? And you can say, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, I, if you look deep enough, you can see it. He had lots. He had lots of plans. He, 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 in essence, he knew the terrain very well. So he, he had a, an idea that the battle could go this way, battle could go this way, battle could go this way. And each one of them, he kind of worked out the, the strategies. But it's, it's a, a rich salience map. It's, it's, it's real intelligence. It's, you see, in a lot of ways, the guys, the generals he faced and defeated, they were like artificial intelligence. So they had this fixed plan. It's very rigid, very narrow. And so when it starts to deviate, you see there's an old saying in battle, the first casualty of battle is the battle plan. So you say, so, but they teach you, if you go to Sandhurst or West Point, or something, they teach you that even though the battle plan isn't going to survive the opening shots of the battle, you still need to have a battle plan. And say, so, well, yeah, 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 okay, that's better than you know, having a rigid idea of how the battle will go. But really what you need is, uh, you know, this kind of deep intelligence of everything. That you, so in, in essence, it's more like Sun Chu and its fluidity of thinking. Sun Chu says, uh, you, you must know yourself and know your enemy. And so... So that's that's the key is what Napoleon was fo was really following really Sun Chu. All these guys really you can see they're following the same the same kind of thing. And and so uh, then Sun Chu also said that is it very slow to engage in battle. You must make basically wait for the opportunity. So you see, I think that I could be wrong, but I'd say like insulate Britain and this kind of strategy. The Roger Hallam is trying to say, well, you know, we'll overthrow the system in six months. I so, say, yeah, maybe it's possible, but I, something tells me that the, the timing is not right. You, 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 you've got to know the exact right time. You see, Napoleon was, 
knew the exact night. So what he would do was he, he set up in the minds of all his opponents, all the opposing armies, he did these things that were really kind of conditioning the minds of the opposing generals. So one of his tricks was he, when he was just about to have a victory, what signaled the victory was he would always hold back the Praetorian Guard. In other words, his Imperial Guard, basically his elite soldiers. He would hold them back. He wouldn't use them in the battle. But when he knew that the battle was gone his way, he would send them in. Now all his opponents got to know that. And so he conditioned them to thinking, when Napoleon has sent, sends in the Imperial Guard, it means we've lost. <laughs> so as soon as he realized the opponents had got that connection, then he started using the Praetorian Guard well. You know, when, when Napoleon had lost, he turned... You know, he snatched victory from the jaws of defeat by sending in the Praetorian Guard and everyone went, oh, shit, we thought we were winning, but Napoleon sent in the Praetorian Guard. We must have made a mistake. We're losing. Retreat. <laughs> but you, you see what I mean? It's like that in the moment, you know what the plan is. So Napoleon would go like, aha, this is this, this is this. It's, it, and then he would say, know exactly, exactly what to do. But he spent a lot of time, a lot of time incubating these things. Before the battle, uh, he, would, he would basically go to bed for like two days. He'd be in his tent and his thing. And, like, and most other generals, they'd be uh, pouring over the maps and stuff like that. But he had already internalized all the maps and knew all the ground. And he's running, you know, scenarios in his head and planning ahead. So a lot of CEOs and business guys, do that they spend a lot of time running various scenarios so as a, as a ceo you you go and you say well this we've got this crucial meeting tomorrow you run a million ways how it could go they could say this they could do that they could offer that and so but when you go into the meeting you must uh give all of that up so the the fatal thing to do is say i know how how to how to turn this meeting to an advantage and then you pursue that and you never never let go. But it, it's better to know, you know 10 ways that you could make it go to your advantage, know 10 ways that you could lose it and try and avoid them, and then go in absolutely fresh without any preconceptions. That's, okay. that's I think, more like uh, Napoleon would have done it. Yeah, so it seems to me that you know, when we do these reading Sun Chu or learn more about the alien cortex through you know, learning and studying uh, and trying to, I guess, fight it. it when, when we actually do the battle, we, it seems to me that it's, we, should also, we, we can have a plan, but we should also be able to let go of it at any time. And so it seems like these tactics and these things that we learned are just would it? Would you say it's like a, a, like a guide or a template to use in battle, but not something that we should be fixated on, pre-battle or, how how would you say? Yeah. No, it's, it's 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 an indicator. So it's a sign. It's a it's a way of pointing. It's a way of like pointing at the moon, but you see, it's it's not a manual. It's not a formula. See, everybody wants a formula to win the battle. So. It, so you can't have a formula to, to win the battle because, uh, you see, our alien cortex is like artificial intelligence. It's a bounded intelligence. So it's closed. It's, its intelligence is closed. So in other words, it's in a chessboard or a ring. It has a very bounded domain, just like AI. AI is great for chess or something like that because everything is in the board. The real world is open. So the... the so the battle space in the real world is completely open bounded and infinite. So, so uh, that's what I was trying to explain to Ryan, but I don't think Ryan, I'm not sure that Ryan got that point, but the, the uh, artificial intelligence um, is strictly bounded and, and always will be by, by its nature. So in other words, I say you can always widen the frame and make a nonsense out of the, the whole thing. So, so saying so in a so so what we're talking about. The reason why I'm talking about you know maybe people might say what what's this Napoleon shit and stuff got to do with everyday life and the office and stuff like that. And say so, 
No, in an office environment, we, the alien cortex is competing against itself. When Napoleon went to war against Wellington and Blucher, that is the alien cortex making war against itself, right? I mean, I can prove it. If, if you put me in a time machine, I go back and um, to the Battle of Waterloo, give me an, for three nine volt batteries and I hold them against the left left cortex of Wellington, Blucher and, and, and Napoleon, there will not be a Battle of Waterloo, right? The guys will go, oh, da, 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 because, you know, if you do a little nine volt cranial stimulation, they will not have a battle. So it's proof that basically the battle is coming from just here on the left side. So, so you say, what is going on on that battlefield? And well, they say, well, Hugh, that's far too reductionist to say that it's just a piece of like, they're huge things, they're political forces, they're all these writers and intellectuals and the currents of history. And like, oh no, they aren't, bullshit. All of that is some story your alien cortex is telling you about. They aren't these tides of history and, you know, class wars and, you know, battles uh, uh, of the bourgeois against the... It's all crap. It's all horseshit. It's all that's happening is our alien cortex is warring against itself. It sees itself as a threat. And the primary threat to an alien cortex is another alien cortex. And so why I'm talking about these battle things and Sun Tzu and stuff, I'm saying like, is we have to live as a householder with all these warring, warring alien cortexes. It's it's a stage we're going through, and you've got to survive it, right? To to get to nirvana and enlightenment, you have to survive this birthing process, right? And so that the we're in the crucible. The, the alien cortex is cooking. So you know, you you have to engage. You can't do a parallel polis. You can't go and make, you know, your own permaculture garden in one corner of Auschwitz. <laughs> Just not going to fucking work. You have to stand your ground in your boots and play the game. It's it's mandatory. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, you can you can go and bug out and go and get a go on a little plant. You can go and get yourself a little patch somewhere and do a Paul Kingsworth and stuff like that. But you you won't escape your alien cortex. You'll find your alien cortex out there. You'll be doing battle with your own alien cortex. You'll you'll sit there, growing cabbages and doing permaculture, and you know you, you will go like, why the fuck am I doing this? Is this right? Should I be helping other people? Will the rains come? You, you're not going to get away. You, 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 it, it's like I said in one of my videos. It's like trying to escape Jurassic Park with a fucking Velociraptor in the fucking driving seat. You just can't do it, man. <laughs> right, yeah. So I just want to prod a little deeper on that. He said, so those, what we read, you know, these tactics, they're indicators could you elaborate more about an indicator and how it's different from a manual? So, so it's it's the, the indicators to what wisdom and intelligence is. So so uh, the ways of of surviving. So it's you know it's saying like uh, life will find a way. So um, people want a winning formula, and so you. So I'm not giving you a winning formula. I'm, I'm just saying that this is the way it works. And so, in other words, the way nature, the way nature stays, stays alive is by kind of covering the board. Right? <laughs> it's by diversity. So nature puts a bet on every fucking square. And then it's what that does is it makes sure that somebody survives and life carries on. See, what everybody was is, how do I make sure I get on the winning square? And you say, uh-uh. The, then there's no winning strategy. There were losing strategies, but no winning strategy. So, so it's in other words, if you don't play a chip on the roulette table, you're not going to win. If you don't have a lottery ticket, you're not going to win. So, if you don't play the game, you're not going to win. So, there's a losing strategy straight out. So you say, oh, okay, okay, I'm not going to play that losing strategy, but what's the winning one? So, put the chip down on the fucking roulette table. 
Roll the wheel and we'll find out. It's like this. This is a crapshoot. It's no. There is no winning formula. But a sure way to kill yourself, right? But you see. But as soon as you say that, that's not quite right. Okay. And you do you see why? Because you're saying like, okay, there. There's not a winning formula, but there are losing formulas. So you see, people are generally on a losing formula because they go to the roulette table and they say, "Ooh, I've got a winning formula. I'll do the gambler's fallacy. I'll double down on every bet." Those guys are gone. See, most people that are trying to beat the roulette table, right? They're doomed. But the mere fact that they're trying to get a winning formula, or see, they start to see patterns in the data. They start to mistake clustering for you know, the gambler's fallacy, oh, I'm on a winning streak, I'll play that. They start getting these delusions. All of those delusions will kill you on this roulette table of life, right? So, so it's very important to understand that, that although you can't say, oh, the, the key is to put your chip down on zero every time. It's like, no. It's, it's like there's no such strategy like that. But you see, there is a kind of a winning strategy because I've just kind of given it to you in an under, underhand way. You're saying don't play a strategy is, <laughs> is a better strategy. Will that make sure I win at this game? No. <laughs> but it'll make sure you don't lose, <laughs> which is like yeah. real important. <laughs> With where I'm this at, is an all or nothing game. Right? It's not a matter of, um, I mean, you know, it's best not to play the game, but we're put in this situation to play the game. And so, I mean, it's not about... I know, no, you see, there, or, there, that's the oh, problem. You have to play the game. So that's what I'm right, saying right. is, is, is you are in this world where you, where, you, where you like it or not. So, so if you say it's best not to play the game, that's suicide. Right? That, that you, you have the option not to play oh, the game. Goodness. It's basically Fien and Barbara It's like, like you, you, everybody has that option. It's like... Why? Why do that option? It's it's better to li to play the game, enjoy it, and win. Maybe right. win. Yeah. yeah winning so is just playing it again. Yeah. We're put in a position. Winning is just carrying on playing the game. Yeah, we're put in a position to play the you game. You see who you see the winning the winning thing is to is to stay alive, right? Yeah, so, I agree with that. So you know, like as a as a species, we, we win as a species if we don't go extinct. So every everybody's going to go extinct, right? We're all going to die. Everybody's going to go extinct. But you know, you, you still play as if you, the longest best game, and yeah, that's the game. So yeah, I think that's where I was going. Keep, keeping the game going is the game. Yeah. yeah. How how do we best keep the game going? You know. So I think that's that was overall kind of the question I had. And uh, yeah, the, the, the conversation had some well, the, points. Well, you just have to be clever and what, well, not clever, but intelligent. So it, you have to be like Sherazade. So Sherazade kept on telling stories all the time to keep herself alive. And that's the, kind of the same thing is, is Napoleon is like all these guys, you know. Uh, the alien cortex is kind of like a psychopath. And so we like bicycle riders. We kind of keep on pedaling. Like, I mean, sharks don't have to keep moving in order to stay alive. But, you know, like the myth of the shark has to keep moving to stay alive. It's, we're kind of in the same predicament. We've we got to just keep uh, keep moving to stay alive. And, you say, well, and people are asking all the time, what, what's the winning thing? What, what can I do? So I don't have to keep moving. I can stop, but it's not done. You say, you can't. You're a shark. Get swimming. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I agree completely. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I go dark if someone says, how do I not keep moving? And then don't play the game. And then, you know, that leads to that conversation. But I always try to say, but. Uh, what's no, the fun no, in that's that? the wrong kind of dog right what's okay <laughs> yeah well but you see see it sounds like oh you have to keep swimming all the time well this is too much work i might as well die and you're saying no 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 there's another point with where, where the shark isn't is not is effortless right 
So, in other words, playing the game is effortless. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. You see, the better and better you get at playing the game, <laughs> the less effort. So, you see, uh, what sabotage and ecotage and wrecking and all of this stuff is is making the other guy carry more burden. You wear the guy down. You see, the, see, see, most people think of like victory against the state or something like that as like this overwhelming force where you crush the enemy. Say, so, nah, nah, vic victories are seldom won that way. V victories are won by making uh, the war too expansive for the other, the other party. So this is, this is what these guys with the gambler kind of mentality don't get. They, they want a, a decisive all-time win. And you say, like, nah, there's no such thing. No such thing. Your decisive win tomorrow, like 10 years later, will just look like one battle in an ongoing war. So it's, it's like, it's so you, you want the other guy, the other alien cortex, the losing alien cortex, the one that gets pruned off and gets put in a grave, uh, the one that doesn't continue the game. You want, that one must feel the burden, must feel the stress and stuff. So for in the terms of the state is, you, you must make the politicians, make all these guys trying to, who, trying to keep control wear them down you see they you, you in other words you're like uh, like a bird in uh, in a flock you you know you uh, you're parasitic on the other guys you must wear the state down by being parasitic where the where the the tough guys where the the controlling guys the ruling guys the leaders the uh, the, the auschwitz itself make auschwitz pay 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 till it's uneconomical it can't you know the prisoners must make the the whole enterprise uneconomical. And that's where we are with civilization. We kind of have to do it kind of fast now. But, you know, we have, you know, see, it's, it, see, okay, like, let's take a topical example, like the vax or something like that. You know, it's like, so it's like, you, you don't want to be absolutist about not getting the jab. <laughs> But you want to make them work so fucking hard <laughs> to give you the jab that is like not worth it bother. They shouldn't have even bothered. That's a bit. True. So it's not a bit. So you see the difference. Like making sure you don't get the jab is not the victory. The victory is making sure that they've so worn down, they've expended so much resources to get you to, t to do it that it's not worth their while. That's a victory. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good one. I think, I think that that's a lot to think about. And um, yeah, I, I guess that's another thing to uh, consider that there's a, there's always another layer, another frame that, you know, I guess we, we get stuck in a frame that we don't see that there's a, a bigger picture to it. Uh, did you have anything more to say, Hugh? No, no, that's plenty, but we almost uh... Yeah, Ten minutes cool. away from the yeah. next. Mm -hmm. So I'll I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Well, Thank you. Oh. Yeah, that's good. That's good.